بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الحمد لله رب العالمين الصلاة والسلام الأتمان الأكملان على خير خلق الله أجمعين وعلى آله وصحبه ومن اهتدى بهديه واستنى بسنته إلى يوم الدين اللهم علمنا ما ينفعنا وانفعنا بما علمتنا وزدنا علما وأرنا الحق حقا ورزقنا اتباعه وأرنا الباطل باطلا ورزقنا اجتنابه وجعلنا ممن يستمعون القول فيتبعون أحسنه آمين وبعد السلام عليكم ورحمة الله وبركاته The last thing that we covered in the seerah of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa before Ramadan was the miraculous event of Al-Isra wal Mi'raj. How Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala took his Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam on that miraculous night journey after a very difficult time in his life. And so he went on that he went on that night journey to Al Masjid Al Aqsa and then from there up to the heavens and back in the same night. And this took place in the tenth year of the prophethood. The tenth year of the prophethood of Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Now remember, we mentioned that after returning from his trip to al Ta'if, Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam ended up entering Mecca under the protection of Mut'am ibn Uday. And so he needed protection because his uncle Abu Talib had passed away. And remember we also spoke about why he traveled to at Ta'if. Because he had enough of his own people, Quraysh. But he didn't want to give up on his mission. And so his mission to spread the da'wah was still uh, his number one priority. And so he was hoping that the people of Taif would accept Islam. And we covered that incident and how that did not end up happening. And so he ended up returning to Mecca. And so the Prophet wasallam was now continuing his da'wah in Mecca. He was continuing his da'wah in Mecca. But he noticed a stalemate in terms of the position in Mecca. Even though there were people trickling into Islam, generally it was a stagnant state, meaning that there was not much progress. He was not finding much progress in his da'wah. And so Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa felt the necessity of finding an alternative base, somewhere where he can have the freedom to propagate and spread the deen of Islam. And this was not his own decision. You know, anything that the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam decided to do any step that he took was all by the command of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And so the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam was actively pursuing this goal of searching for a base besides Mecca. And he did this by meeting the Arab delegates when they would come for the Hajj. And so in the Hajj season, this was a time and opportunity to meet different kinds of people who came from all over Arabia. And so, and so they would gather, they would come, uh, all the various tribes of Arabia would come for the Hajj. And so the Prophet wasallam would devote these days of the Hajj in visiting the various camps of the Arabs, introducing himself and asking for protection and support 
from the leaders of the tribes. Jabir ibn Abdullah radiallahu an narrates, the messenger of Allah used to appear before the people during the Hajj season. And he would say, is there anyone who can take me to his people? For Quraysh have prevented me from conveying the words of my Rabb. And he sallallahu alayhi wa would also say, I don't wish to force any of you to do anything. Any of you who agreed to what I may, to what I ask, may do so. But I don't want to compel anyone not so wishing. All I want to do is guard myself against those who want to kill me, so that I may, so that I may fulfill my Lord's mission and carry out whatever decree He wishes regarding myself and those who support me. But what was the result? And so. The result was that no one accepted him. Each and every single one of these tribes that he would visit, he would present to them his, you know, his his mission, the da'wah of Islam, and he would ask them for support and protection, even if they did not embrace Islam. You know, just like previously, he had his uncle Abu Talib, who remained a kafir until until his death. But he supported the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam, and this is the kind of support that the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam was looking for. And so, no one, none of these tribes really responded positively. In fact, each one of them arrived at the same conclusion: that this man's own tribe knows him best, Quraysh. How could we accept? How could we accept someone who has undermined the authority of his own tribe and his own people have expelled him? And so his own tribe has not accepted him, and they would know best. And so this was the conclusion that they arrived at. Now, what made matters worse, what made matters worse was that. As the Prophet وسلم, would go from one tribe to the next, inviting them to Islam, he would be followed. He would be followed by who? By Abu Lahab. And on other occasions, Abu Jahl. And whenever the Prophet وسلم, would speak to a tribe and then move on to the next one, Abu Lahab would come behind and basically tell them not to listen to this man. He would tell them that he is a liar. Abu Lahab would say, this man is calling you to part ways from the religion of your forefathers and to get rid of Allah and Al-Uzza, their idols. This is what he's calling you to. And so the Prophet ﷺ went from one tribe to the next, presenting his offer and hoping for a positive response. And he would take with him some of his closest companions, like Abu Bakr and Ali. In one narration, Ali narrates, he says, when Allah ordered his messenger to present himself to the tribes of the Arabs, he left along with myself and Abu Bakr for Mina. And so Mina is where the camps are set. And this is after the main rituals of Hajj, on the day of Arafah. After that, the pilgrims spend two to three days in Mina, in their tents. And so Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa was visiting these different Arab tribes. And the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa would often be in the company of Abu Bakr when he was visiting these various tribes. Why? Because Abu Bakr was a specialist in ancestry, in genealogy. He knew the history of the tribes. 
He knew the names, the legends, all the all this information regarding regarding who is from who and who the notables and the leaders of various tribes were. He had this knowledge. And so this was an asset that Rasulullah was taking advantage of. Not only that, but Abu Bakr was also a well-known man. Anyways, Ali radiallahu an, he says, we went, we went to meet a tribe. And you could see the calmness and the dignity of these people. We wanted to greet them. Abu Bakr went to them and asked them, where are you from? So they said, we are from Banu Shaylan. So this was the name of the tribe, Banu Shaylan. And so Abu Bakr radiallahu an, he went to the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam and he told them that, look, these people, they have experience in warfare and they also have power. So Abu Bakr radiallahu an went to the group leaders. He went to their leaders and these leaders were Mafruq ibn Amr, Hani ibn Qubaysa, Muthanna ibn Haritha, and Nu'mad ibn Shariq. The person who was closest to Abu Bakr radiallahu an was Mafruq ibn Amr. And this individual was described as being very handsome and he was known to basically uh, be someone important in their tribe. So Abu Bakr asked him, how many are you in number? So Mafruq replied, we are more than a thousand strong. And a few men cannot be a thousand as they say. So Abu Bakr asked, how would protection be with you? He said, we go to the limit and all people have their limit. Abu Bakr also asked, and how is it when you are at war with your enemy? So Abu Bakr asked this because he was trying to assess their strength. So they said, when we meet in battle, we are the angriest of men. We take greater pride in our speed than our sons. We care more for our swords than our camels. Victory rests with Allah. Sometimes we are victorious and sometimes others are victorious over us. And then Mafruq asked Abu Bakr, you seem to be a member of Quraysh. So Abu Bakr replied, yes. Then Abu Bakr, he said, have you heard of the Messenger of Allah? So Mafruq, he said, we have heard that there is a man who claims to be the Messenger of Allah. Then Mafruq wanted to hear from Rasulullah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. As you can see now, Abu Bakr, he paved the way for the conversation. So now Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam came and Mafruq, he asked him, what do you propose, O brother of Quraysh? And so the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam started speaking. He said, I call you to worship Allah Subhanahu Wa Ta'ala Allah, to bear witness that there is none worthy of worship except Allah. He has no partners. And that I am the messenger of Allah. And I ask you to shelter me and protect me until I carry out what Allah has ordered me to do. Quraysh came out against Allah's commands and have de denied his messenger. They have sided with wrong against right. But Allah is the all-powerful, the all-praised. So this was the introduction of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa Mafruq, he was impressed by these words. And so he asked the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa for more. He wanted to hear more. So the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa recited some ayat from Surah Al-An'am. Then Mafruq, he said, and what else do you propose, O brother of Quraysh? He said, I swear, these are not words of any human being. If they were, we would know them to be. 
So Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam then started reciting some other ayat from Surah An-Nahl. And then after the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam finished, and after he explained the message of Islam, the other leader from this tribe that we mentioned, Hani ibn Qubaysa, he said, look, we have people behind us and we cannot speak for them. Meaning, we are a group that have come from our tribe. There are people at home, we have to consult them. He said he liked what he heard, but he could not commit without consulting his people. Then Mafruq, he said, I consider that abandoning a religion and following you in yours because of one meeting with you, which had no introduction nor follow-up, and without giving it full consideration, nor examining what the consequences would be of what you suggest, that would be wrong. That would be a rash judgment and inadequate consideration of the consequences. So as you can see, they were impressed. But they were hesitant. Hani ibn Qubaysa, he said, we cannot just convert right now. Let us see the response of another leader. So the third leader, who was also present, Haritha, he was a religious leader. He said, I have heard, and I like what you have said. So they are all impressed, as you can see. He went on to say, I was impressed by your words, but our answer should be that of Hani ibn Qubaysa, the second person, who said that we cannot proceed, we need time. And so he said, for us to leave our religion and follow you after one sitting with us would be like us taking residence between two pools of stagnant water, one in Al Yamama and the other in Al Samama. What did this mean? Rasulullah also did not fully understand what he meant. So he asked them, what are these two pools of stagnant water? So now the fourth leader, he stepped in and he explained, Al Muthanna. He said, one of these pools of water is where the land extends to the Arab world. And the other is that of Persia and the rivers of Kisra. He said, we would be breaking a pact that Kisra has placed upon us to the effect that we would not cause an incident. We would not cause any trouble with them nor would we give sanctuary to a troublemaker. This policy that you suggest for us is something that kings dislike. As for those areas forging neighboring Arab lands, the blame of those asking would be forgiven and excuses for them would be acceptable. But for those areas next to Persia, those acting will not be forgiven and no excuses would be accepted. If you want us to help you and protect you in whatever relates to our territories alone, then we would do so. Basically, the land of this tribe of Banu Shayba, or Banu Shayban, it was bordering with the Persian Empire. So they came from the area of Iraq. They were the Arabs of Iraq. Their military leader knows the contracts between them and the Persian Empire. They had a treaty between themselves and their neighbors, the Persian Empire. And so Muthanna, he said, we have an agreement between us and the Persians that we will never give sanctuary to a troublemaker. And this religion of yours is something that kings do not like. So he realized, he realized from the meeting with Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam that this is something that kings do not like. Because 
kings and authoritarian tyrants. They want authority in their own hands without being held accountable. While Islam is a religion that frees people and holds people to account. So he refused to offer protection from the Persian side. But he was ready to offer protection from the Arab side. So this is what he had said. That if you want us to protect you from the Arabs, we'll do that. But if you want us to protect you from the Persians, we can't do that. And so what was the response? of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa He responded by saying, your reply is not bad. It's understandable. You have spoken eloquently and truthfully. You are honest. However, the religion of Allah can only be engaged in by those who encompass it from all sides. If only you patiently wait a few years, you will see how Allah causes you to inherit their lands and their homes. And how Allah will give you their women. He's referring to the Persians. The Prophet ﷺ was basically mentioning this prophecy. That in the future we will be victorious over them. You just need to be patient. The Prophet ﷺ said, Allah will cause you to inherit their land and give you their women. Will you not then glorify Allah? So here Rasulullah did not want to have a half deal. He wanted full commitment. He wanted complete protection. And so this was his engagement with this tribe. Also among the tribes that the Prophet ﷺ visited during the days of Hajj was the tribe of Banu Amir ibn Sa'a. Their leader was Bayhara ibn Firas. And so he met Rasulullah ﷺ and he heard his words. He was so impressed that he said, I swear. If I were to have this brave man of Quraysh, I could eat up the Arabs with him. Bayhara, this leader of this tribe, he noticed this quality of Rasulullah of being daring. Here he's being rejected by his own people. But he's committed to his mission. And he wants to continue. He wants to further his cause. And he realized that I can use him. But he was thinking politics. Basically, Bayhara, he saw that Rasulullah possessed these qualities that were unique. And he told Muhammad وسلم, if we were to follow your orders, and then Allah gives you victory, victory. Allah gives you victory against those opposing you. What will you do? Will you hand over power to us after you are gone? And so this man, he was power hungry. All he is looking at is power. And so the response that he got from Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa he said, the earth belongs to Allah and he will give power to whomever he wills. This decision doesn't rest with me. Allah gives victory to whomever he wills. Allah gives power to whomever he wills. And so the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa meant here that this is not what is important. All power belongs to Allah. So the man he replied by saying, Are we to present our throats to the Arabs for your defense? And then if Allah gives you victory 
through our help. Down the line, we will see power go elsewhere to other than us. And so this man, he turned down the offer of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Now what ends up happening is, after Hajj, this tribe, Banu Amir, they went back to their homeland. And there was a wise elderly man who would not come with them for Hajj because he was too old. But then he would ask them about the trip and what happened on their journey. So he asked them about this journey to Hajj and they told him that we met a young man, the grandson of Abdul Muttalib from Quraysh. And he claimed to be a prophet of Allah. But we rejected him. He offered us to join us if we give them if we give him protection, but we turned down his offer. So this old man, he put his hands on his forehead and he said, Could your mistake be put right? Can the consequences of your judgment, can they be reversed? He said, I swear, no descendant of Ismail has ever made such a claim falsely. It must be true. If he said that he is a messenger of Allah, then it must be true. Where did your good judgment go? And so this man, he was elderly, he was wise. He was basically saying that none of the descendants of Ismail السلام, had ever claimed to be a prophet. The Arabs don't know the concept of prophethood. The Arabs, they never had a prophet. Prophets came down the line of the brother of Ismail, and that is Ishaq, through Bani Israel, one prophet after the other, until Isa alayhi salam. As for Ismail alayhi salam, none of his descendants was a prophet except Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. The Arabs were an illiterate nation. They were not educated. They didn't have any scriptures. So they didn't understand this idea of prophethood. So if someone has come and he is claiming to be a prophet, then it must be true. And so this old and wise man, he wanted to know if their mistake could somehow be reversed and they take on the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. Also among the tribes that the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam was, uh, that he visited was the tribe of Ben Hanifa. And they treated the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam so badly when he came to them and he spoke to them. Imam Al-Zuhri, he says, None of the Arabs gave him so rude a rejection as they did. And it is a sunnah of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala that when people deal with his messenger in such a way, they meet their fate in the worst of ways. And so it was these same people Banu Hanifa. They came from Al Yamana, which is in central Arabia, which is today outside of uh, Riyadh in Najd. Banu Hanifa were the same ones who, years later, they revolted against Muhammad. It happened right before his death. And so even he passed away and it continued. Their revolt, they revolted against the Prophet They went back on their Islam because towards the end of the life of the Prophet everyone accepted Islam. All the tribes came and accepted Islam. There was no more 
shirk left on in the Arabian Peninsula. But you had some who they apostated. They accepted Islam and then they they went back to Kufr. And so their revolt continued even after the death of the Prophet ﷺ. It did not end until the time of the Khilafah of Abu Bakr radiallahu an. And these were the wars, that the battles that Abu Bakr initiated with the Murtaddin, the apostates. They were referred to as Hurub al ridda the wars of apostasy. And this revolt was led by who? Musaylama al kadhab Musaylama, who was the one who claimed prophethood. And so it was the same people who, when the Prophet ﷺ met them, he met them in Mina, in the days of Hajj, and they not just rejected him, but they behaved with him very rudely in a very bad way. So these are examples of the discussions that the Prophet ﷺ had with the various tribes during the Hajj season while he was searching for a base. He was searching for support, somewhere to go where he will be supported and protected. And we saw the subsequent reaction of these various tribes. In the end, there was one tribe that responded positively. And we will talk about that insha'Allah ta'ala next week. And so that is an entire story that we will go through uh, next week, bi idnillahi ta'ala. And so what we will conclude with today are the lessons that we can learn from this event and these discussions and these meetings that the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam had with the various Arab tribes. Among the lessons that we learn, first of all, is the importance of freedom to preach the deen of Allah Subhanahu Wa Ta'ala without obstacles. And so it is one of the most fundamental pillars of the da'wah to be able to give da'wah and preach the message of Islam without any opposition without any anyone coming and uh, anyone coming in your way and preventing you from preaching the message of Allah as Allah has revealed it and so when we are blocked and we don't have that freedom from spreading the message of Allah. We need to look for protection and guaranteed safety. And so this is Allah's message to His creation. Islam is Allah's risala. It is His message to mankind. Our job is to make sure that it reaches mankind. Islam did not come only for one tribe. Allah did not send Islam only for Quraysh. And this is something that the Prophet wasallam he understood very well. If it was only for his people, his family, his tribe, then he would have stayed in Mecca. And he would have continued preaching. And this was the case with previous prophets. Almost every, in fact, every single previous prophet and messenger was sent for his own people. Only his people. Except Rasulullah wasallam, was sent for all people. For all of mankind. قُلْ يَا أَيُّهَا النَّاسُ إِنِّي رَسُولُ اللَّهِ إِلَيْكُمْ جَمِيعًا Allah says, say to them, O Muhammad, I am Allah's messenger, O mankind, O people, I am Allah's messenger to all of you. And so the Prophet ﷺ understood this very well. And so that is why he could not sit in Mecca. 
as long as he is facing this opposition and he is unable to freely propagate the message of Islam, then he had to look elsewhere. And so what we learn from this is that Allah's deen needs to reach everyone. And so we cannot sit down and become pragmatic and passive and simply accept the status quo that, okay, this is our situation. What can we do about it? There's nothing we can do about it. Let's just sit down and just accept the situation as it is. No. The du'at and the preachers to Islam, they don't sit passively, but rather they get up and wherever they find an obstacle, a hurdle, they go elsewhere. The second lesson that we learn is why the Prophet ﷺ was searching for this protection and support. We notice this from his interactions and his discussions with these tribes. It was for two reasons. Firstly, he was looking for protection for the da'wah, as we mentioned. So that there are no obstacles in conveying the message of Islam to people as it has come from Allah. Without distortion. And so the deen of Allah needs to be propagated as it is. If there are people who are preventing us from doing that, then we can't accept it. And so if there are people who are saying, this is what you were going to talk about regarding Islam, and as for this, don't talk about it, then we have to reject that. We have to reject that. And so, the first reason why the Prophet ﷺ was doing this, he was looking for protection for the da'wah itself. So that there are no obstacles in conveying the message of Allah to the people as it has come from Allah without the need to distort it, without the need to, you know, uh, convey certain things and conceal certain things. Secondly, the Prophet ﷺ was looking for authority in his hands and not allowing authority to be in anyone else's hands. And this is natural. And this is a necessity for the da'wah. It was not an attempt by the Prophet ﷺ for a power grab. He wasn't greedy for power. That's not why he was looking for authority. But rather because if authority is in someone else's hand, then you become limited and restricted to operate at their discretion. They will dictate to you what to do and what not to do. And so you have to answer to them. And the deen of Allah requires that no one comes no one comes in between. In between the da'wah and conveying it. We don't take anyone's permission. And so Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa yes, he was the prophet of Allah, the messenger of Allah, but he was also a leader. He was also a leader. And he had to have leadership and authority in his hands. And this is what we find here. The Prophet ﷺ was going to the various tribes to see not only who would give him protection to freely spread Islam, but also who would give him the authority. And we see that in the discussion he had with one of the tribes when they said, if we are victorious, will power and authority come to us? And so the Prophet ﷺ said no. The third lesson that we learn is 
the importance of targeting the leaders and the people of influence in society. And so the Prophet ﷺ went straight to the leaders of the various tribes to give them da'wah. Why? Because if they accept the message, so will their people. But if they do not accept it, it is unlikely that anyone else would accept it. And so people are generally, you know, under their leadership. And no one wants to go against their leaders. And so it doesn't make sense for the Prophet ﷺ to go and talk to the regular people and give them da'wah. If they accept, tomorrow their leaders will force them to reject it. Also, here the Prophet ﷺ was seeking protection. And the only ones who could guarantee him that protection are who? The leaders. And so Abu Bakr he went straight to the leaders. He went straight to the leaders of the tribes and he spoke to them. And he asked them, who are you? Where do you come from? What are your names? And so this shows us the importance of targeting the leaders and the people of influence in society. And that is what we should also do. There are people who are influential in society. We should make an effort to reach them and to present them the message of Islam. If they have influence and they have followers, then tomorrow if they accept Islam and they you know, make it public, you know, their followers will also accept Islam. And we have seen this throughout our history and we have seen it even today. And so there are many examples of that, of famous people, influential people who when they accept Islam, those who look up to them, and admire them, they also end up accepting Islam. The fourth lesson that we learn is that the likes of Abu Lahab and Abu Jahl, they exist in every society, in every day and age. Wherever you have the da'wah spreading, you have people like Abu Lahab and Abu Jahl, who come and they will use every means and every media that is at their, you know, at their hands, they will use it to distort the message and the messenger. To distort the message and those who are spreading the message. And what, they, what will they do? They will appeal to the emotions and the sensitivities of the people. Because no one can stand up against the truth itself. The haqq is plain and clear. And so when you fail to bring down the truth, you have to resort to something else. And so you have to resort to lies and name-calling, and appealing to the emotions of the people, the sensitivities of the people. Certain things are sensitive issues. Let's bring these issues up to prevent people from accepting Islam. The example of this is what did Abu Lahab do? What did he say to the tribes? He said, this man, you know, he didn't refute the message of Islam. He didn't come and say, look, uh, I can prove to you that there are more than one God. I can prove to you that these idols that we worship are true gods. I could prove to you that Allah does not exist or that um, you know, Allah is not the only one worthy of worship. No, he didn't do any of that. Why? Because he can't. And that's why it's extremely important for us in our da'wah to focus on those areas. To focus on the fundamentals of our deen. The oneness of Allah. And the tawheed of Allah. Because these are concepts that no one can refute. Anyways, what did Abu Lahab do? He didn't, he didn't bother doing any of that. Instead, 
try to appeal to their emotions. He said, are you going to abandon the religion of your forefathers? That is a red line for the Arabs. Are you going to accept someone who is speaking bad about your idols, Allah wal Uzza? That's a red line. And so the same thing today and in every day and age. The enemies of Islam, when they fail to bring down the truth of Islam in the eyes of the people, they resort to appealing to their emotions. These people are backward. They will say about the Muslims, these people are backward. They want to bring us back. We have advanced as a civilization. Look at where we have reached. They want to restrict your freedoms. Look at how they treat women. Look at this, look at that. Appealing to the emotions and the sensitivities of the people. These are red lines for the, these people. Their way of life. Their liberal and secular way of life is something that they enjoy. They don't want to give it up. And so the point here is that the likes of Abu Lahab and Abu Jahl, they exist in every day and age. Wherever the da'wah is spreading, they will pop up and they will do everything that they can to ward the people away from Islam. The fifth lesson that we learn, and this we learn from the interaction that the Prophet ﷺ had with Banu Shayban. that tribe. That tribe who basically said that we can offer you protection from the Arabs, but we cannot offer you protection from the Persians. What we learn from this is that in our negotiations, we need to keep in mind that the deen of Allah needs to be held in high esteem. And so we cannot bargain and we cannot negotiate in it. If a certain agreement does not fulfill Islamic terms, we don't have to get involved in it. And so Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam did not agree to the offer of being protected from the Arabs, but not being protected from the Persians. Why? Because if tomorrow the Persians say, you have to hand them over to us, then they have to agree. And so, even though the Prophet ﷺ was in a desperate situation in Mecca, he needed to find somewhere to go. And here he was being offered something, but it was, it was, you know, half-baked. It was a half-offer, and it was not complete. And so, what did the Prophet ﷺ say? He said, no. This deen requires full commitment. It requires full commitment from all areas, from all aspects. And so nevertheless, even though the Prophet ﷺ was in that dire situation, it did not make him to compromise. And so he did not get into that agreement that was half-hearted. And this is a lesson for us, that we should also not compromise on our deen. Islam requires full commitment. Islam is a deen that requires your full time, not part time. Not that you practice Islam in certain areas and you abandon it in other areas. The sixth lesson that we learn, and this we learn from the interaction that the Prophet ﷺ had with the other tribe, Banu Amir. That tribe who said, the leader, he said, if we are victorious, will we have power? And so he was impressed by what the Prophet ﷺ had to offer. And he was ready to, you know, give him that protection. But he was after power. And so what we learn from this is that there are some people who are hungry for power and authority. And they are not sincere in supporting the mission. They are only looking for their own self-interests. So if they come and they show interest, 
that I'm willing to help. But you notice that there's something else that they are after, then they are not sincere to Allah. And so what this deen requires is people who are sincere to Allah. Those who want to promote the cause of Allah for the sake of Allah, not for their own self-interests. These are the people that we need. Why? Because those who have their own self-interests in mind, if they see their self-interests fulfilled through Islam, they will come and they will support. But then, once they have fulfilled their self-interests, they will wash their hands off of you. And they will throw Islam behind their back. And this is what we have seen throughout our Islamic history. And this is what we see even until today. There are people who see that Islam is rising in certain Muslim countries, and the people want Islam, and so they will offer. They will say, we want to. We want to rule by Islam. Or we have an Islamic agenda. And then when they rise to power, and they have power in their hands and pressure mounts on them to not implement you know, uh, the laws of Islam, they start to back down. They start to back down. And so these people, they have their own self-interest in mind. They wanted power. That is all they wanted. And that's why the Prophet wasallam here on this occasion, what did he do? He didn't give it to him. This individual from this tribe, this leader, he was willing to help. But the Prophet ﷺ turned him down and said, no. Power will not be, I cannot guarantee that power will be in your hands. Authority and power is something that Allah will give to whomever he wills. Even though here, again, the Prophet ﷺ was in a desperate situation. And he could have used these people at that time, but he did not. In an authentic hadith, the Prophet ﷺ says, we will never put in charge in our work those who desire it. We will never place someone as a leader, put him in charge, if that is what he wants, if he comes asking for it. If he comes asking for it. The final lesson that we learn from these meetings that the Prophet ﷺ had with these various tribes is a very important lesson in the da'wah. And that is the relentless effort of the Prophet ﷺ in finding a safe haven for Islam to flourish and not giving up, but rather continuing with full optimism. Here the Prophet ﷺ was being rejected. He was all already rejected by his own people, Quraysh. He went to Ta'if, he came back rejected. He's looking to go elsewhere, and he goes from one tribe to the next. And he's being rejected, one after the other. He did not give up. And he was not pessimistic. He did not think negatively that, look, I'm not getting anywhere. I might as well sit down and, you know, give up. But rather, he knew and he had conviction in his heart. And he had that iman that eventually, eventually, I will get a positive response. I will have somewhere to go. Why? Because he knew that it was a command of Allah. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala wanted him to do this. To search for a new base. And so he did not give up, even though he faced one rejection after the other. And it is as Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says about his messengers. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says 
in Surah Yusuf, after mentioning the entire story of Yusuf السلام, and what he went through and what his father Yaqub went through, after mentioning that entire story towards the end of Surah Yusuf, what does Allah say? Until when the messengers despaired, they fell into despair. And they thought that the messengers had been denied any help. The people had thought, that's it. These messengers are on their own. They have no one to help them, no one to support them. Until it reaches the limit where you're about to lose hope completely. Allah says, At that point, our help and our victory eventually came. And so this is what we learn here. The Prophet وسلم, after facing one rejection after the other, eventually what ends up happening? Eventually what ends up happening is that he approaches a people and he comes to the tents of a people during this Hajj season a people who are ready to commit wholeheartedly a people who when he sat with them he saw he saw how they were ready to accept Islam even before they said anything. A people who Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala guided them to come and meet the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam in order for him to prepare the way to his new base. And they are basically the Ansar who we will speak about next week insha'Allah ta'ala. And so with that, we come to the end of tonight's session. Subhanakallahumma wa bihamdik. Ashhadu an la ilaha illa ant. Astaghfiruka wa atubu ilayk. Wa sallallahu wa sallam ala nabiyyina Muhammad. Wa ala alihi wa sahbihi ajma'in. Wa assalamu alaykum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh.